Welcome back, everyone, to this episode of 1YL, or One Year Later. My name is Corey, and today we are having an amazing guest on One Year Later. Like you guys all know, One Year Later is a podcast show amplifying the voices of people taking adversity into their own hands and changing their world and the world around them. And today, that guest, who has definitely taken adversity into her own hands, is Danusha Francis. Danusha, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Hi, Corey. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Heck yeah. Well, we were just chatting a little bit, a little sidebar before we hopped on. Like, it's just a cup of coffee, maybe a cup of tea, because she's actually in the UK at the moment. But um, we're having like a nice, uh, a nice cup of tea getting and you guys are getting an inside look as to as to like what we would chat about. But um, a little bit of accolades on Janusha before we move forward. She doesn't really need an introduction because she's epic, no matter what bio is described before her 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 name and her interview but she is a, a very long time friend she also um competes for team jamaica which there's a whole story there and where that comes from and actually i have a surprise for danusha um i put on my team jamaica jersey hey. for our interview today yes <laughs> you know me i had Hi. to she was a reserve for the uh, Great British Olympic team, and she also competed and was an outstanding student athlete for UCLA Gymnastics and won the NCAA theme title. Um, she's epic, works for College Sports America, helps kids get placed in colleges in America from all over the world. She's just awesome. And the coolest part, guys, she is qualified to compete at the 2020 parentheses one Olympic Games <laughs> um, in Tokyo for Team Jamaica. So congratulations, Nush. It's like so epic to just get to follow your journey and get to be a little piece of encouragement along the way. So I'm happy for you. Thank you so much. Crazy. Heck yeah. It is crazy. It's literally crazy. OK, so without further ado, let's get to the one year later questions. Um, the first question we always start out on the show with is, where were you one year ago, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever you want to answer, however you want to answer it, where were you one year ago and what were you doing? So one year ago, um, I was still, I think, waiting to hear what was happening with the Olympics. So having qualified the October before, so October 2019, I knew I was qualified. So it was kind of at that point where the pandemic was hitting every single country. We'd just gone into a lockdown and I would say mentally, I was pretty down, just kind of having made my dream come true of qualifying and kind of just having to get that cherry on top of actually competing and then maybe not quite getting to do that. Obviously, you're completely powerless. Um, so I think emotionally, just waiting for that decision um, was pretty hard. Um, yeah, and then, like I said, we were in a lockdown, so doing Zoom trainings, and that's where I was physically. Um, yeah. Just Waiting game at that point. For sure. And a, one part of the story of last year I remember following up with you on was that because you're technically t Team Jamaica, but living in the UK, it was hard for you to be able to find a spot to train because you technically weren't on the nation's national team, but you are absolutely an elite athlete who needed space to train. So what was, what did that, tell a little bit about that and like where things are and how things like panned out with that. Yeah, so when I originally made the switch to Jamaica, it was all very amicable. And even since then, um, all the people at GB know me. Obviously, I used to compete for Great Britain. I did, I've done a lot of competitions as a guest. And yeah, they've been nothing but supportive. And then in the lockdown, everyone was in complete lockdown. And then it was in June that they allowed elite athletes back to training. Um, the government did. And then it was each governing body that was able to decide who was considered elite. And so um, kind of just out of courtesy, my coach um, emailed British Gymnastics because, um, I mean, if you're qualified for the Olympics, then you kind of think you're elite, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Seems yeah. right to me. Yeah, and our, our gym was really prepared with all the protocols in place. And um, he obviously explained all that. And then we just kind of got this response like, no, she's not elite. And we also had another gymnast at Pizza Sweden who wasn't elite either, apparently. And um, yeah, so... I kind of put the put a few tweets out and stuff because I was just gobsmacked and um, mm. a few media outlets 
reached out to me, including um, BBC and Sky. And so um, I did a few interviews about it. And then when they called up British Gymnastics for their comment, it was the same day that they reached out to me to make me some offers. Um, so they offered me to train at the um, National Sports Centre. And then they also offered me to train at some other gym clubs, all of which were a much longer and further drive for me. And obviously on with people I don't know, um, for the National Sports Centre, my coach wasn't even supposed to be allowed to come. So it's kind of just asking for an injury as well, in my opinion, like on equipment mm. you're not used to, maybe not even with my coach. And obviously I'm trying to get back into shape for the Olympic Games. So yeah, right. I just kind of said to them, okay, thank you for the offers, but why can't I train at Heathrow? We've literally got all the protocols in place. Um, it will just be me and my coach or me and one other athlete and my coach. Yeah, so... Um, I didn't get a response to that one. Um, but eventually I actually reached out to the government and um, they kind of said that it was British Gymnastics that could make the decision. And then British Gymnastics since then in all the subsequent um, lockdowns have allowed me to train. So thankfully that's okay. I'm training now. Um, we're in another what lockdown now to train. Wow, what a journey. Yeah, I feel like I keep seeing like, I follow a couple of YouTubers from the UK and they're like constantly on lockdowns and it's like one day they'll like go out and they'll be like, we're off. And then it's like, nope, the next episode that I'm watching on YouTube, they're back in lockdown. Like, I'm sure that's taken an emotional toll on you. Like, like from a challenge standpoint, like how have you been doing with just the what's happening in the world, but also being able to focus on advancing you and your career and what your dreams and goals are for your gymnastics career, but also your life and business and I know you do a little bit of stunt work here and there. Like, how have you been doing emotionally trying to, like, sift through all of that the last year? Um, yeah, I think I am pretty emotionally stable, I would say. Like, I, I'm emotional in that I'll cry about things. I have empathy for, for other people, but I'm quite, like, emotionally stable yeah. in terms of mental health. Um, but I think even the most emotionally stable people probably have found some parts of this hard. and. Um, I've actually had some family members um, who have suffered and my cousin who I was quite close with, she actually passed away. So um, that's obviously been tough and like sort of going into training um, on my own as well. Um, it's hard to take your mind off things where I say like when everyone is back in the gym and you're just in a normal training session, it's a bit easier to take your mind off of off things outside of the gym. So I remember the day after um, she passed away and I was in training just me and my coach and like, I couldn't stop thinking about her and obviously mm -hmm. that wasn't the best session of course um, so there's definitely been things like that and um, then there's other times when I'm just like okay I'm so lucky I've got to go and do some stunt work I've got to train and there's so many kids at home that aren't allowed into their gyms so for the most part I've just tried to focus on the good um, and the positives but I think you do have to allow yourself um, these down moments and obviously for me those moments of grief um, and yeah it's just it's a challenging time and I don't think that anyone can say it's been completely smooth sailing or easy. Right right well one way that you have inspired me is the way that you are taking on I would say a responsibility to inspire gymnasts all over the UK and all over the world with these zoom sessions that you're doing while gyms aren't open for that younger generation of the next up and coming elite gymnasts. Um, talk a little bit about what it means to you to be able to, you know, hop on a Zoom call with smiling faces looking at you, whether it's a flexibility session or a training session or whatever you might be doing with them. Like, what does it mean to you to get the opportunity to really work with those kids in a in a season that your your goal was is like in a limbo in a limbo place but like you're able to still inspire those kids to keep chasing their dreams yeah i think um they inspired me right back as well like just seeing them on the zooms and when they're trying their hardest um that's just as inspiring to me um but like you said it's become a way of life and i also do take it as my responsibility like when i get a message or an email um asking about my zooms i try to fit in absolutely everybody um, and yeah, I've definitely stretched myself a bit too thin at times. So now I kind of put some rules in place, like no Zooms on Sundays and just like, you've got to also look out for yourself. There was definitely a point yeah. where I was like seven hours of Zoom a day. Um, so oh my that was, gosh. Yeah, so that was just a bit, a bit much. Um, but I think, yeah, I've definitely took it as a responsibility because I think um, all, I've always got great feedback from them. So if I can just 
give an hour of my time and um, inspire or motivate or challenge and um, make people stronger then it's worthwhile and especially I mean they get obviously used to their coaches on zoom every day so for the coaches I think it's just as helpful to have a fresh face for an hour um, so yeah I think it's helping a lot of people and then also maybe people that um, look up to you and they um, maybe want to meet you in real life it's almost as good as that so that's been really cool as well to do some Q&A's and stuff like that so I think Zoom's been a really cool tool to just connect loads of other people that maybe you wouldn't have ever connected if it wasn't for Zoom. Right right man I didn't even have a Zoom app on my computer a year ago and then here we are like <laughs> most most used app of all time. <laughs> Literally like what was Zoom a year ago? <laughs> <laughs> seriously, seriously. Um, okay, well, I mean, I feel like we have a good groundwork. It was, it was definitely like a roller coaster of a year with definitely like those like ups and downs. But I think the coolest part that I'm hearing from you and like the tone of your voice is like I, sitting back in when I was in California and I I got the news that they were going to cancel the 2020 Olympics. Like you were the first person that came to my mind and the fact that what what where i went mentally was like i i know that your story of you know being the reserve athlete for the british team coming to ucla then all of a sudden you go back and you like are working towards becoming like going to worlds to like qualify a team to jamaica and then you just missed the opportunity to go and represent jamaica in 2016 and then here you are eight years after you were reserve athlete and you all you 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 again get the news that it's not going to happen that year and now you're one year later and i mean in my head and my heart like it was just breaking for you in that opportunity that i know you have been chasing after and and just like man you you put it you put it properly on your instagram story yesterday like you're trying to get one centimeter better on that <laughs> on on that release move you're doing right and like you really have taken on this goal and this dream of yours one centimeter at a time for lack of a better way of putting it you know and i'm i i want to be one to say like i'm so proud of your perseverance through ev all of the adversity that has been thrown at you and you know as sad as i was in that moment when i got that espn notification that officially they had been canceled and my heart just sank for you like it was also like someone asked me like, oh, do you, do you think that she'll still like hold out for the next year? I'm like, 100%. Like there, <laughs> there, there is no, <laughs> it is happening. It is happening. So well, I just wanna like tell you I'm proud of you and, and just your perseverance is so inspiring. So, um, Thank you so much. of course, we're gonna take a turn into the next question. And uh, the next question is, I want to talk about two turning points of the last year that either brought you hope to get you to where you're at now, mentally, physically, emotionally, um, or maybe two turning points that were negative moments that were, you were like, oh, we're going to have to dig myself out of this hole. But like, what were those two things that potentially could help encourage someone to know that you came out on the other side of those, of those massive moments in your life? Um, I would say... The first one was finding out that it was postponed rather than cancelled. Um, kind of like what you said, it's literally taken me so long to get to this point. What another year at this point, and I've persevered for so long. And this is my dream. And um, I don't know if everyone can even relate because it's not like this dream is going to really change my life. But it's just like my heart and my passion, and just like the biggest tick off my bucket list ever. So, um, and it's literally it's my life. So I want to do the things that I want to do. So. I want to live it and be able to say I did the Olympics. And so mm -hmm. that year, um, yeah, it's, it's annoying and a bit frustrating. There's days when I'm like, oh, retirement sounds amazing. But at the same time, it wasn't cancelled. So that moment there was great. Um, and I actually just almost like the same day or a couple of days later, I um, bumped into this guy um, who does boxing for GB. Um, and so we were just talking about it. And it was just nice that to have that same feeling of relief that it wasn't um, cancelled and yeah and just to speak to someone that was in that same emotional roller coaster in that boat of waiting for that decision um so I definitely know that there's a lot of athletes feeling the same way even right. though us older athletes it is a bit frustrating but <laughs> right um, right a turning point um and yeah. I'll say the second one 
Um, I would say, well, during lockdown, I um, came to live with Elliot, who's my fiance. Um, mm-hmm. So I wouldn't have lived with him properly till after Olympics because I mm-hmm. live where I train. Um, and I think that it was just really nice. Well, I'm still here now, but it's really nice to see like a glimpse of my next chapter um, yep. sort of properly. Because um, I mean, we're engaged, but until you live with someone, you, you can't be a hundred percent sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> but now love- we live together for like a whole year. Um, so I think that's the turning point and yeah it's just like that next stage in our relationship and yeah like I said a glimpse into that next chapter of sort of married life and moving forward and sort of life after gymnastics as well. Totally totally well I was gonna ask you because I, I, I didn't know at what point to bring up the fact that you are engaged to <laughs> Elliot and that's like so exciting we're like over the moon for you but what was the original plan like had the olympics happened in 2020 like were you planning to get married in 2020 2021 like when was that going to happen yeah so we planned to get married in 2021 um but as soon as the olympics was postponed we postponed our wedding a year as well um just because i didn't want them so close together um Mm -hmm. so yeah so yeah we would have been getting married this year but now it's next year um got it so that was kind of like the same thing it was like oh bit of a shame um yeah but then it's like well it's not cancelled we're still getting married that's the important thing um yeah 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 I love that I love Mm -hmm. that well you know I I mean I bring up that piece of it because I feel like that was another piece of the last year I have a lot of friends that are gonna be on one year later and one of them is a, a a wedding florist and you know her business got completely flipped upside down and when you don't when like there's no weddings that can happen like you don't have a business to be able to provide flowers for those weddings and like the ramifications in everyone's life is just so different and like obviously it sounds to me like you had definitely mentally prioritized the olympics knowing that like there was other steps that were going to be in place for sure in the future you're engaged nonetheless you know you know what i mean like you there's a commitment level there so um Man, that's cool. Okay, back to the turning points. I'm getting a little bit flustered. <laughs> but the turning points, I mean, yeah, the Olympics getting postponed versus canceled. Huge, big. I mean, I was think, uh, I was like thinking that that was probably going to be a huge turning point for you. Because what that yeah. means, like, for the gymnastics viewer of this of this podcast, like, that means that you were not able to, like, touch a pair of, or, like, touch uneven bars for months yeah like pri- prior to the games and that was already nerve-wracking knowing that potentially they were going to happen and like you didn't have it, you, any ability to like actually do your skills on real equipment during lockdown and that's yeah. terrifying but then you go through the next phase of the turning point being okay phew they're postponed so i can actually get on the equipment and like knock on wood we're able to like train the whole year so that I'm able to have that preparation and be able to to like head over to the games and feel a little bit more prepared. So no doubt, like it was probably a mix of emotions of like hope and desire and but also like wondering what the ramifications really will feel like. Um, yeah, as it just that powerless feeling was the worst part of it. It was like doing those Zoom sessions every day, but still not having the decision. Um, right was just like, yeah, that was probably the hardest part because obviously Zoom training is just, it's not the most entertaining. Um, and so yeah, I was just doing every day, sort of going through the motions, but without that definite goal in mind. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, well, um, there was one thing I also wanted to touch back on and it was when you were talking about, you know, your dream is definitely the dream for you. And no one else can really like relate to why the perseverance after this goal um, is so significant to you. But I do recollect one moment that is really like the picture that I have in my head of how important this goal is for you. And that was after Worlds when you went down media row. And I remember you, you were just, you were in tears during an interview. And those tears for me, I mean, number one, when you say that you're like pretty like, level emotionally like it's true guys like we were together at ucla gymnastics and she is pretty level emotionally but also she has like a really fun like level (laughs) emotion but like really fun side so when i saw those tears pop out at worlds like i 
those tears were like the years and years of training to then know that like your name was qualified to the Olympic games. And yeah. that's like the first part of the checkbox to, to take off, to make sure that you're like on your way to accomplishing your goal. So I just think there, those emotional pieces of the puzzle, like I want to make sure everyone's not confused. Like that was not a sadness cry. That was like yeah. <laughs> incredible joy. So can you like describe a little bit about like what that moment really unpack it just a little bit for everyone? Yeah, um, I'd say back in 2012, I believed that I could make the Olympic team. Um, and I, I still would say I did believe that. Um, and then again in 2016, well, 2016 was a bit different because I almost like went in with like a, let's see how we get mm -hmm. on in the world championships because i kind of been out of the elite game um, for a bit when I went into that one. And then if I qualify, then um, that's like a bonus. And then so obviously sort of qualifying for the test event, but not ending up doing it um, was like another step on believing in myself. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say just sort of that 2019, that whole year, was just really me coming to this next stage of believing in myself. And um, yeah, and then finally sort of having that justification that I finished the competition, I did all that I could possibly do to really make it a reality, um, was all those feelings that came up when they sort of asked me what it would mean for me. Um, so yeah, I think it was just kind of that like, yeah, I do believe that um, I can make my dream come true. And I think that was those feelings that were coming up in that moment. And like I said, in 2012, I did believe, but it was just almost like another level. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the best part was like in 2012, I was being selected for a team, whereas this time it was kind of more objective. Like I was either going to make it by my score or I wasn't. Um, so it was kind of like all up to me. And it was like I did that. And I was just like proud and just, yeah, just like, yeah, it just felt very like full circle in a way. Oh, man, man. Well, you have so many Team Jamaica fans now, I'll tell you that. I mean, I, Cool Runnings has always been my very favorite yeah. movie, like, of all time. But then, like, to know that, like, one of my very dear friends is now competing for Team J Jamaica, like, are you kidding me? Like, my world's going to turn green and yellow before you know it. It's just... Yeah. It's just the way that it is. It is. Okay, so rounding out this um, awesome time together, you know, you said one year ago, um, you know, things were a little bit of a mystery. We didn't really know what it was going to look like in the in the next few months, even the next year, whatever it was going to be. But um, now I want you to retrospectively look back. And my final question for this interview is, did your one year ago self believe that you could be here one year later? Um, yes, the only thing that came to my mind was um, maybe the one, the one skill that I've been posting on my Instagram. I think one year ago, it was just kind of like a complete joke, like just something to mess around with in training. And then now I actually am starting to believe that it's possible. And I said on my Instagram, I'm getting one centimeter better every day. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So I think that's the main thing that just popped in my head that is a different mindset. And I think with these sort of big skills, you know that half of it is sort of mind over matter. Um, right. But in terms of everything else, um, kind of once I found out it was postponed, not cancelled, I think my one year ago self would be proud of myself today and, um, yeah, and would believe that just how strongly – I want this dream. So I think it wouldn't be too surprising to my right. one year ago self. <laughs> hey, I love that. Hey, that that's good. I love that. You know, this, you, when you talk about like the skills piece of it too, like not a lot of people outside of the gymnastics world really understand what it means to like get a new skill, let yeah. alone get a new skill when you are eight years after your prime. <laughs> Like, you know, and, and the idea, like, I know what that skill is. I've never done it. I, I haven't done a lot of gymnastic skills, but I know like enough to know that like the skill that you are doing is very difficult, but it will also get you a lot of bonus. So I'm like cheering you on. I'm like really trying to like make this happen. Let's, let, let's manifest this out into the world. We're getting the Danusha the skill one centimeter better. We have so <laughs> many, we have so many days to make that one centimeter a little bit better. Yeah. But at some point that centimeter needs to stop or else you're going to fly over the bar. <laughs> yeah. Well, the funniest <laughs> part is 
the girl who invented that skill, and I'm pretty sure um, her and I think only two others have done it. So that just shows you how hard it is. One of those being Mustafina, the um, Olympic gold medalist on bars for the past two Olympics. So I'm setting my goal pretty high on this skill, but that's real high. If I can make this skill, it's just like an easy like change in my routine. So that's why I'm going for that skill. But um, yeah, so I messaged Elizabeth Sykes, who um, like invented the skill. And um, she was like, told me that she stopped doing it because it's so hard. <laughs> not in those exact words, like not in those exact words, but just something along those lines. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> and you invented it, great. So I really have set my bar pretty high on this one. But if I can oh do it a handful of times, I'll be happy. <laughs> hey, there we go, there we go. Well, Denisha, this has been so fun. Um, I want you to know that you have a big fan in me over here. And quite honestly, the way that we, these interviews are going, like this is this is the third interview that will be posted. And, and, and the coolest part about it is I've started to like sit back and I hadn't had this thought when I originally reached out to all of you, but it'd be cool to like come back and do this interview one year from today and yeah. just get to like get to like hear like where things have been since then get to go back and watch this you know 25 minute interview and just see like where where things have gone from now you know i think yeah. we, we both have like hopes and dreams of what the next year can bring but i know for sure that viewers of this interview are going to be encouraged and be filled with hope knowing that they have been inspired by your story and they have likely experienced some of the similar things that you have. So thank you for sharing your story and, and thank you for inspiring people. You're so welcome. And it, just in case the viewers probably don't know this, Corey sent me the best messages of all time on the day that I was competing at the 2019 World Championships qualification for the Olympics. And he said such inspiring words. I set them as a reminder on my phone. And then every time I went back to my bag, which is like loads, obviously you go and get your handguards, all your other stuff, I would just look at it and it just filled me with this like happiness and just reminded me to be myself and that I've got it all, all that power that I need within me. Um, so I'm expecting one of those on competition day in Tokyo. Um, and thank you know, you. <laughs> at, this, at this point, you know, number one, that like makes my heart explode. But number two, uh, at this point, like I'll text you whenever. Like I, it's just, if you need a little pump up speech, like there's no one easier to give a pump up speech than to you because I know that you'll listen and you'll, you actually like want to read my my message. So I'm like, let's go. I'm, the up the Olympics. I'm just going to be waiting for your message. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> she re she rejects even going down the vault runway until the message is received. I'm standing there with my phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. On the TV. Sorry, <laughs> text me. <laughs> it, it happened. Come on. One, one more minute. Oh my gosh. Too fun. Okay. Well, when, when all the lockdown stuff is over and I can come to the UK again, yeah. you can count on me. Let me just tell you. Like, I'll be account. there. I will be there. So, um, <laughs> Danusha, thanks again for being on the show. Everyone, I hope you were so encouraged by this episode. And tune in again tomorrow for another amazing episode with another amazing person sharing their story from one year ago and how they got here one year later. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you guys later.